good time of the day to everyone who is joining us for today's webinar of Razum We Stand, the Ukrainian-based organization active internationally that is very much committed to fighting Russian fossil fuels, phasing out fossil fuels globally and escalating the clean energy transition in Ukraine and rebuilding Ukraine and international scale. So the title of our webinar is uh, how the EU, the US and the J7 should respond to global threats from the proliferation of Russian oil gas and coal experts. And we are we are welcoming experts in the field of sanctions and also clean energy transition. Uh, and I will now announce a panel of speakers that we are happy to host today. And we will start from Anna Korpu, research professor at Friedhof Nansen Institute and the leader of the Climate Strategies Coordinated Work on Russian Energy Transitions. From Isaac Levy, uh, Europe, uh, Russia Policy and Energy Analyst uh, Team Lead at the Center of Research on Energy and Clean Air, Korea. Why have Rahun Nandan, Europe Russia analyst and research writer at the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, Korea? And also Oleg Savitsky, who is Savitsky, who is senior campaigns manager at Razum We Stand. And moderating today's webinar, uh, my, I myself, I am Svetlana Romanko, founder and director of Razum We Stand. So we would like to bring the highlights uh, given the existing political complexities with the imposing new sanctions on Russian oil and also gas and LNG gas in particular, with discussing a few questions, um, which will be to deep dive into the state of play regarding Russian fossil fuel exports with details on every single type of a fossil fuel that has been or not yet has been uh, sanctioned. Discussion on the financial implications of previous sanctions embargoes on Russia unpacking the steps uh, needed to close the gaps and loopholes in the current sanctions, assessing the recent embargoes that have been imposed by the US just recently and also the 12th sanction package adopted by the EU authorities finally, and explaining the overarching significance for urgent action to dismount the pro proliferation of Russian fossil fuels for global peace and climate action. Because we need to be mindful, of course, that after COP28 that has been hosted and in oil-rich country with um, visiting Russian president visiting and making a new deals, we can't expect anything like another proliferation of fossil fuels planned with OPEC plus and other groups of fossil fuel producers that don't understand that the days um, are uh, days of profit are also coming to an end with the clean energy transition that has been escalating just recently. And with that optimistic, hopefully note, I'm starting with Anna. Anna, uh, please bring some light into, uh, into the uh, effectiveness of the coal ban on Russian coal that has been the very first to impose uh, back in April 2022 with a three months compliance period, which ended on August 11th. And tell us what the facts are um, actually around the coal ban? Was it um, currently effective? Is Russia still earning some profits on the coal exports and how the things are in this area? Thank you so much. To Anna, um, to you. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, yes. So hello everyone, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me. A very exciting and very important talk. I will be covering um, the sanctions on Russian coal sector today. Um, and as many of you probably know, um, the main sanctions are by the EU on, on, on the coal sector. The EU started embargo on Russian coal in August 22. Um, and also, actually introduced a ban on transport and insurance and finance services on Russian coal, but it got lifted almost immediately afterwards and never really entered into force. There are also some sanctions against the technology trade with Russia, which is definitely very relevant to the coal sector, as most of Russian coal sector technology has originated from the Western countries before the war. Also, Japan has set up an embargo on Russian coal, but it's been implemented with delay and slowly proceeding towards less and less coal. And there are other, I would say, less significant sanctions by various countries. And I mentioned some of them, but mostly because 
because those countries have not been major buyers uh, of, of coal from Russia. So let's first look at the impact of the coal embargo, and this is the EU coal embargo. Um, so in I would say that we have to divide this into volumes and profits. Um, and they kind of cross a bit in the sense that in 22, uh, the coal exports did decline by, according to the Russian numbers, by 7.5%. So the I, uh, IEA estimates that it's been a bit deeper uh, decline, but then the exports have already been recovering quite significantly uh, this year on the country level, as new customers in Asia, especially China and India, have been found and contracted. But I must say that the main coal production area, Kuspas in Kemerva, has um, got much bigger heads and is still going to decline significantly this year. The latest data shows more than 5% decline. But when it comes to profits, of course, 22, which kind of saw the declining volumes of exports, it saw record profits. The war, uh, when it started, it skyrocketed coal price internationally, and this allowed the Russian coal producers to pro provide 50, even 60% discounts when finding new um, customers in Asia. So, of course, if you sell it half price, then it works, right? Um, and this kind of prices have not been seen, I don't know if ever, but it's been a record peak on prices. So everything should be looked from that perspective. So now that the prices have been coming down 23, still high uh, at about 125, 150 US dollars per ton. So the uh, profits have declined in comparison to 2022, but they still are such that um, the Russian coal production export remains profitable. And it um, allows making the discounts, giving the discounts to the Asian um, customers, which of course maintains this activity, maintains all the increased costs that we go into in a minute. And then I would say that impact on sanctions, and here I would say embargoes, the coal embargo, and also other sanctions on other uh, previous export products to the EU are at a uh, stake here. So um, there have been problems with uh, transport towards the east because of the very limited rail transport capacity. The eastern rail track is the bottleneck for Russia. And since before, it was largely kind of reserved for coal exports. Um, the situation changed very much because most export products started moving to that direction instead of the EU. Um, so they, became, they got domestic competition and congestion of that rail track, which May came up. Uh, this made the federal level to think that coal should be less important export product to that direction in order to allow more uh, valuable export products to be sold to Asia. Of course, what you do then you try other routes. Then and and the Russian coal producers have start started exporting uh, their coal via European port, Russian European port, to Asia as a very long way, and it's much much more expensive, of course. Building more rail capacity is ongoing. It has been ongoing for a long time. It was supposed to be ready 2017, and it's still not that. So it's going very slow. And in addition to this, one should also consider the knock-on uh, knock effects of the domestic reactions to this rail congestion, and what one could call the war economy. Uh, so there's been, for instance, temporary discontinuation of some transport quotas, as they are called. So that some regions have had a guaranteed amount of coal that they can they can then move with uh, by rail to Asia that has been discontinued and and then when it was reintroduced after a lot of lobbying by these regions um, they came up a bit smaller and these regions have really felt it. Um, of course, also coal related subsidies for railway trans uh, railway transport has been eliminated. This has been as a result of the other embargoes together with coal and rail tariffs for coal have increased very significantly. So this has, in some cases, added the uh, transport cost to twi twice or three times even. So I got some uh, quotes for you from Puspas, the main coal production region. So well, as they say, the problem is not to extract the coal, but to get it out. And this is indeed the main problem here. And without the rails, it's not going to happen. And Especially, I would uh, draw your attention to Sergei Civiliev, who is the Kuzbas governor and a 
kind of main spokesman for Ashton Cole, or even on the federal level. And he's been talking about this capacity problem already for a long time. Um, and he's very upset about very little being done, even though he has been outlining the problem much before the war, uh, the more active war since last year. Of course, the rail, uh, Russian railways, they say that it's been very bureaucratic. So it, they spent five years discussing before anything could be done. So, of course, internally, this is a difficult issue, but an important one. Um, then I say a couple of words about the actual sanctions on transport and related services by the EU and other countries. So I would say that there hasn't been much impact, whereas the coal embargo has clearly had an impact uh, that could be improved, but with the help of these transport and related services, such as um, financial services and especially insurance of ships. Um, so almost three quarters of ships transporting coal from Russia, from the European side, uh, is still insured in countries which are sanctioning Russia. So doing something about this might be a quarter. It seems a bit strange that we embargo coal and then we help Russia to transport the coal to another market. I mean, what's the point? Mm, and EU lifted the sanctions uh, in order to combat food and energy insecurity around the world. And I'm not saying this is not a valid argument. I'm sure that, for instance, transporting food is very important, but I haven't seen any real in-depth analysis on this issue of energy security. And I'm just raising this that, that it might be a good uh, issue to kind of discuss further. A couple of words only about the technology sanctions. So you have banned export supply and delivery of a number of technologies that are very important for the Russian coal sector. Russia has set up already in 2014 and maybe even before an import substitution program. They aim at producing domestic technologies so that Russia could be much less dependent on imports of technologies, especially for the coal sector and also for other sectors, of course, now. Um, but I see very clearly, and also the Russian federal level sees very clearly, that, for instance, course bus coal companies are very reluctant to switch to domestic technologies, probably because they don't trust the quality. And domestically, there's some debate whether they actually still have access to Western technologies through third countries uh, that I don't know, and it'd be very hard to study. Uh, so just to, to mention that. But there's been quite a lot of discussion about uh, the technology issues in uh, domestically. And um, for instance, Maxim Basel from Suez says that without the Western equipment and components, it is difficult to maintain the current level of production. And journalist Anna Ivanova, she points out that we won't get far with Taurus alone. This has to do with, at some point, and even maybe still only only trolleys, the coal trolley is being 100% Russian. Most of the other things actually had uh, components from other countries. Um, and then Leonid uh, Starosiet, who is the Minister of Industry and Trade in Kuzbaz, is pointing out that we are ready to produce technology. If the coal companies are happy to buy it, it doesn't seem like it. All right. Um, of course, we would like to see coal sanctions that function and will impact the Russian coal sector even more. There was kind of, um, in terms of volumes, there was kind of a good start, uh, but it was um, kind of outplayed by the very high coal prices. Now that the coal prices come down, it, there will be kind of, if you like, a chance to make this more effective, um, even if the kind of turn to the east has been successful, that there are new markets in Asia. But for instance, if the EU reduced its own dependence on coal and stopped boosting the world energy, uh, the world, world coal price, this would of course make the Russian coal also less valuable because if the EU keeps buying coal from others who used to buy coal from elsewhere than Russia, they will go and buy the Russian coal and this will push the price up. So uh, if the EU will, Let's coal go also from other sources that um, surely would kind of stabilize and normalize the coal price to something like $1,820 per ton, which is probably going to start hitting the uh, kind of limit of profitability of many Russian coal suppliers export. Um, and of course, I already mentioned transport and services. It's, it would be one way to stop 
for the EU to stop helping Russia to transport its coal to other markets. And I did that there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Just to remind to our listeners that the presenter was Anna Corpo, research professor at Friedhof Nansen Institute and the leader of the Climate Strategies Coordinated Work on Russian Energy Transition. Thank you so much, Anna. And I will check if we have any questions uh, from the audience, but maybe if the questions will be coming at the end of the webinar, it's also fine. But if you could just summarize in one sentence uh, what's a lesson learned from Colben must be be uh, used as the best political strategy for the EU moving forward and banning coal in total, and also any ideas on Asia and the East, where the coal has moved significantly in the scale, it, it still has been imported. Yeah. Well, if we, if we talk about EU policy and embargo on coal, I suppose it sounds grandiose and great on paper, but what I didn't say, and I assume people know that coal sector is not so significant in the Russian economy. So in that sense, of course, it's kind of from war, stopping the war point of view, it's, it's in economic, economic terms, it's more or less cosmetic to stop that. Maybe that's why the EU hasn't really pushed for it. But it could cause more sort of regional unrest and maybe sort of also unhappiness in some regions politically. So in that sense, they might have an impact beyond its economic value. Thank you so much. And uh, we are looking forward to invite our next speakers. Uh, Isaac Levy, Europe Russia Policy and Energy Analyst Team Lead at the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, Korea, and his colleague, Vaithav Rahunandan, who will be uh, reporting on the oil ban and oil price gap and did it weaken the uh, Russian economy and what steps must be taken faster uh, towards the full defunding of Russian fossil fuels and locking them in the ground completely. To you Isaac. Thanks very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that there. And I'll move this section across so I can see you guys. Um, brilliant. Well, I want to say a huge thank you to um, Razan We Stand for inviting us to this brilliant um, online um, expert panel discussion. Um, I'm Isaac Levi and I'm with my colleague Vaypav today. Um, so who are CREA and what do we do? Just to give you a little bit of an introduction for those of you who think there's a slightly odd link between the Centre for Research on Energy and Clean Air and the Russia team. So um, what we do is we provide analysis and data, as well as policy recommendations, tracking fossil fuel revenues that Russia receives and are a key enabler for Putin to wage the war against Ukraine. Um, we've been a key convener and insight leader in the sanctions advocacy space and were set up as a team directly after um, the invasion of Ukraine um, in response to some of our colleagues' call for greater data analysis on this topic. Uh, we're a small dynamic team that aim to provide analysis um, somewhat ahead of the curve and some of the examples there could be our laundromat report, which we'll briefly summarise, but uh, sparked a lot of political interest and um, stimulated other NGOs to produce some analysis on this topic too. Um, we present advice analysis to senior colleagues, uh, so policy makers, as well as um, journalists and media outlets too. On the right hand side is a screenshot of our live Russian fossil fuel tracker, which ticks up as we track um, further exports from Russia of fossil fuels to the world and also to the EU. I'm now going to pass over to um, Vaypav, who's going to briefly summarize the recent trends. Thanks. Right. Thanks a lot, Isaac. And thanks again, Razum Vistan, for calling us here today. So I think, obviously, we all know that Russia's budget dependence on fossil fuel earnings has always been very high. On the chart, you can see there has been a drop since the sanctions came into place. And while obviously that is commendable, we still believe it's not enough. In fact, we have just produced, uh, the team at CREA has produced a great bit of analysis on the impact of the crude oil price cap, which came into place in December last year. And we did a one-year analysis of what really has worked, what hasn't worked. As if you don't mind shifting to the next slide. So one of the first key things we noticed was that there has been an estimated 34 billion euros drop in Russia's oil export revenue. 
A huge amount of this has been caused and has happened in the earlier part of the year, simply because as soon as the sanctions came into place, it forced Russia to drop its oil prices. If you can see the chart, the top, the top one, you can see that the discount has reduced as it has gone on. And that is simply because they found new markets, they found markets that are willing to purchase their oil and it's just a supply and demand. If you go to the next slide, Isaac. One of the key reasons that that discount has dropped is because a lot of non-price cap coalition countries have increased their imports of Russian crude. In the period that in, in the period of one year, price cap coalition countries dropped their imports by 59.5 million tons, and non-price cap countries have increased their imports by 65.5 million tons. Obviously, the volumes have offset any losses that Russia might have faced, and it has also shrunk the losses in the second and third quarter of the year. The discount has shrunk similarly, meaning the reducing the impact of the sanctions themselves. Some of the key countries, if you go to the next slide, the countries that have massively increased their consumption of Russian crude oil are China and India. Interestingly, China's volumes of imports have increased 26% in the past year, but the value itself has gone down, which suggests that they have obviously reduced their imports once the discount shrunk. In contrast, India's have really remained relatively stable throughout the year, and they've risen to a mind-boggling 123%. I think Isaac will highlight this later on in our presentation, but there is actually a country provided a derogation within the EU that is importing crude oil. And as he has done fantastically in two investigations, he shows how they have capitalized on loopholes as well as used the derogation itself to send back more revenue to the Kremlin. It's Russian oil has also found its way into new markets. We know that there were a couple of shipments of crude where that went to Brazil, a country that had never imported crude earlier. And similarly, it went to Myanmar, where it goes to the PetroChina refinery. Uh, yeah. We've seen that, again, you can see in the chart that since July, the price of Urals has constantly risen and is now above the price cap, which is a brutal condemnation of how it has actually not, the sanctions have not worked and the price cap is obviously not being adhered to. The enforcement is especially weak in the Pacific trade. Uh, data that we've seen from India and China indicates that a huge number of buyers pay well above the benchmark price, the Euro's price cap. And yeah, I mean, this has also allowed this sort of enforcement play failure has essentially allowed Russia to manipulate supply uh, markets with supply cuts. Go to the next one. This is our recommendations has always been focused around how we believe that the price cap is too high. And some uh, a simple bit of analysis is that just setting the price cap at US dollars uh, 30 would have slashed Russia's revenues by 56 billion till now. In fact, in November itself, this full enforcement of the price cap would have slashed Russia's revenue by 14%. We believe that uh, lowering the price cap is deflationary. It will reduce the export prices, but also induce more production just so that they can bridge the gap. And unfortunately, that is where we believe this impact of the sanctions is failing. I'm gonna pass back now to Isaac, who is going to highlight a little bit more about the enforcement itself and also speak about the couple of loopholes that we have noticed and he's investigated in the sanctions. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Vipav. Um, in this slide here, I'm trying to show the reduction in Russian oil volumes that are transported on um, tankers that are owned and insured in price cap countries and therefore have to adhere to the oil price cap policy. You can see in this graph here, this is that marks the invasion of Ukraine and uh, a slight decrease in the oil quantities transported on um, price cap um, um, 
uh, tankers that have to adhere to the price cap. And then since the um, oil price cap was implemented with this second line, a further reduction, especially seen in the crude oil um, markets. But Russia's earned over 139 billion euros by exporting seaborne oil since the imposition of the price cap and embargo. Um, however, more than half of this oil has been transported on tankers that are owned and insured in G7 or EU countries. Therefore, we're deducting that there's not enough shadow tankers to transport Russia's oil and circumvent the cap. Instead, traders are evading the price gap by attaining fraudulent documents and reporting the oil price um, that they paid for this oil um, as below the cap, when in fact we believe this is um, uh, not uh, the case. Uh, and that's backed up by evidence um, analyzing the customs data, customs declarations. 35% um, of tankers transporting crude oil um, were owned or insured in price cap countries in the most recent month of November, um, which was much higher at about 62% for oil products. So this shows that the policy does have strong leverage. Russia is still very re reliant on um, sanction imposing countries to transport its oil, and therefore price levels of the cap should be lowered and the policy must be enforced properly if they are to be successful at reducing Russia's export revenues. So touching on the monitoring and enforcement issues, the policy itself relies on attestation documents that are issued by traders often outside of the enforcement agency's jurisdictions. This means that they're very, very vulnerable to being fraudulently um, produced and lying about the price paid. We think that not enough is being done by the enforcement powers. For example, the UK, which is the largest insurer of Russian oil and about a third of all oil volumes from Russia being insured in the UK, of which the enforcement agency, OFSI, have previously reported only collecting a handful of attestation documents when issued at FOI. Um, without scrutiny, Western companies are not dissuaded from providing insurance or tankers, which obviously provides them with profit, to facilitate oil exports above the oil price cap. Additionally, penalties are incredibly weak. If a entity is caught violating the price cap, they can be excluded from insurance and financial services um, from the West for a mere three months. This is what we're calling a kind of slap on the wrist punishment rather than being banned in perpetuity, which is, was originally discussed when the sanctions were being drafted. We'd also suggest that um, banks are required to verify the payments of the oil to show that they adhered to the price cap. This would shift the liability to the banks for processing payments that would be above the price cap. Furthermore, tankers that transport Russian oil and go through coastal states, which is I think over 80%, um, should provide insurance documents to show that um, the attestation documents are being checked and that oil is not being transported um, riskily without insurance. So if we focus on one of the areas uh, of interest, which is the ship to ship transfers we're seeing of Russian oil, these have increased about 54% in the year of um, since the, the sanctions were implemented until the end of October. Um, part of this will be influenced by the logistics and trade in Russian oil becoming more complicated, with many ships being reluctant to enter Russian ports. However, these ship to ship transfers can also be used to mask the origin of the oil and mix it with other non Russian origin oil to enable it to be illegally imported into those countries imposing sanctions on Russia. So, over 800 ship to ship transfers of Russian oil took place in EU waters alone in the last year. Um, over half of these took place in Greek waters, a specific area called Kalamata, a lightering zone where basically. Um, these ship ship transfers are easier to take place. Um, and this means that the EU has basically enabled 400,000 barrels per day of Russian oil to have been transported, uh, transferred within its own waters one year after implementing the sanctions. The issues associated with this are it can be environmentally risky, as well as some old tankers undertaking S2S transfers without insurance. So if there was an oil spill, um, there'd be no liable body to pay for the um, cleanup. Um, furthermore, it helps obviously facilitate Russia um, higher exports of oil. Ship to ship transfers from price cap compliant tankers to shadow tankers, we believe, should be banned, as should the tugboats and shore support that are required to enable these ship to ship transfers within the EU waters. Um, we've seen instances of vessels turning off their location transponders or AIS 
increase over 225% in the first quarter of 2023. So a lot of dodgy stuff going on to enable Russia to increase its exports of, of oil. Um, Vape have um, helpfully kind of signposted towards this investigation we've been doing on Bulgaria. So Bulgaria was the fourth largest importer of seaborne Russian crude oil in 2023. Um, the country was very reliant on Russian oil, and it has one refinery in Burgas that's owned by a company called Luke Oil, which is Russian owned, um, that basically provides the whole country with um, petroleum. So um, as you can see in this chart on the right hand side and summarized by this fact here, before the invasion, about 70% of all this refinery's oil came from Russia. They used this exemption in the sanctions to increase its reliance up to 93% in 2023. The imports of Russian crude have accounted for over 1.1 billion euros in tax revenue sent back to the Kremlin, and that's just in the first 10 months of 2023. Um, as we noted, the purpose of this exemption was basically to enable domestic supply in Bulgaria. However, this refinery exported 984 million euros of oil products between January and October 2023 um, to basically make high profits um, and um, take advantage of a loophole in the sanctions. So at Korea, we've been tracking lots of ships using our Kepler and marine traffic data sets. And we noted that a specific vessel, the Sea Express, delivered 40,000 tonnes of oil products to the Netherlands produced from Russian oil, meaning that those individuals in um, the Netherlands could be filling up vehicles um, with fuels that have been produced from Russian crude. Since the ban on Russian oil products, tankers departing Burgas in Bulgaria conducted a tripling or three times as many ship ship transfers to perhaps mask the origin of this oil with three specific shipments we've tracked going to the US. The Bulgarian government, after this analysis um, said that they will now end the derogation six months earlier, which cuts off flows of Russian oil into Europe and is estimated to impact their tax revenues to the Kremlin by around 700 million euros, which is a really big result. Um, this has been voted actually on uh, this week in Bulgaria and um, passed, which is which is great to see. However, Russia has still been exploiting um, the fact that they're able to um, import oil into Bulgaria above the price cap, which is really lu ludicrous loophole in the sanctions. Lukol's refinery purchased Russian crude above the cap between August and October, which has resulted in an excess of $231 million in revenues benefited by Russian exporters compared to whether they just paid at the price cap. Um, the Kremlin earned over $156 million in tax revenues per month um, with those exports associated above the cap. This is a quick summary of our report that came out in April this year called The Laundromat, which outlines how price cap coalition countries are importing oil products that have been produced from Russian crude in those third countries. So what we did is we looked at our data and identified all the countries that had increased their imports of Russian crude oil one year after the invasion compared to the year before. And within those countries, which had also increased its exports of oil products. We came up with these five countries, the UAE, Turkey, Singapore, India, and China. Um, the price cap coalition imported 42 billion euros of oil products from these countries that had increased their reliance on Russian crude um, in the one year after uh, Russia's invasions. These five countries are, are huge buyers of Russian oil and about 70% of all of their exports. They, those five countries increased their imports of Russian crude by about 140%. And increase their exports to those sanctioning countries by 26%. I'll briefly touch on the gas situation, but I know that um, uh, my colleague Ole is going to go into more detail. But 44% um, uh, decrease in pipeline gas exports to the EU from Russia in 2022 showed the damage that um, Russia um, received from the production of gas and the lower tax revenue it received. However, LNG, so liquefied um, natural gas, uh, imports to the um, EU from Russia increased by 26%, which partially offset this decline in pipeline gas. Russia has been more reliant on the EU gas market, uh, making up 47% of sales this year, uh, which is an increase from 37% um, prior to the invasion. LNG shipments are reliant on EU ports for transshipment, storage and re-export uh, of LNG to other non-EU countries. 
um, of which we're proposing that the banning of this transshipment could make logistics of LNG exports from Russia uh, more difficult, lowering their profits and the volumes that they can sell at. Uh, Russia plans to expand its gas production, as you've probably seen in lots of Putin's announcement, which basically is a call for the EU to reduce its reliance and prevent investments in long-term LNG infrastructure projects. Um, we've touched on some of these policy recommendations, but um, to briefly summarize on the oil price cap, we believe the oil price cap needs to be reduced, um, better enforced and monitored, um, banning the sale of tankers um, to third country owners um, to, to prevent the buildup of the shadow tankers that Russia has access to, um, providing sale contracts rather than attestation documents to make it harder to forge the price paid of the oil price cap, um, collaboration on auditing attestations across different authorities, um, prohibiting transshipment we talked about and requiring um, internationally recognized insurance uh, when passing through um, the Danish Straits or other territorial waters. Sadly, this was something that was talked about being included in the most recent 12 sanctions package, but not included. In terms of tying up the laundering loophole, which enables Russia to earn higher export revenues of its oil, um, we call for the ban of imports in sanction imposing countries from those refineries that we identify as importing Russian crude um, and requiring those refineries to show that the oil they imported was paid um, below the price cap to enable them to export the products um, to countries imposing sanctions is also key. Um, some other policy recommendations outside of the price cap um, are of course to invest more in clean energy, which reduces reliance on fossil fuels, um, banning LNG imports um, from Russia, pipeline gas and pipeline oil as well, which currently flows into the UK to end with, uh, sorry, into the sanctioning countries. Um, to end with a quick quote, um, every euro spent buying Russian fossil fuels contributes to funding Putin's war chest used to fight our allies in Ukraine. Um, thank you very much for listening. Any questions are more than welcome, but thanks again for organizing this. I'll pass back to Svetlana. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Isaac and Meta. Uh, we will get back to you with questions a bit later. So far, we don't have them submitted in the process. But I would like to pass uh, to Oleg uh, Savoitsky, who is Senior Campaign Manager for Razum We Stand, the global campaign to end Russian fossil fuel addiction, uh, Russian fossil fuels and to end global fossil fuel addiction that feeds Putin's and Russia's war machine and the world-class energy expert uh, to present uh, the position and also updates on LNG sanctions and LNG ban and fossil gas in general to you, Oleg. Uh, thank you, Svetlana. So um, yeah, um, uh, many thanks to Isaac uh, who already presented some very um, robust analysis on uh, the gas uh, revenues uh, that uh, Russia is still uh, receiving um, and uh, I will just uh, 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 give a few highlights um, and uh, uh, while uh, the pipeline uh, gas uh, sales uh, uh, to Europe have uh, reduced dramatically and uh, Russia is not supplying uh, gas to most of EU countries uh, um, the uh, Central European countries, especially Hungary, uh, Austria, and Slovakia, they are uh, still um, uh, buying Russian gas. They are dependent on it. And uh, this ga gas is actually being uh, transited through Ukraine uh, via uh, our um, gas transport system. Uh, and uh, um, this um, is a controversial situation, but the gas transit uh, contract um, uh, ends uh, next year and uh, it is um, very likely that Russia will lose the European uh, gas market entirely uh, once um, the uh, EU um, uh, consolidate its um, gas market regulation uh, and uh, this is uh, at the final stages so um, uh, just a few weeks ago, the uh, European uh, Parliament, European Council, and the European Commission they uh, yeah found a consensus on the principal provisions of the new gas package, 
and uh, uh, it will um, enable uh, all EU member states to take um, decisive uh, steps to uh, ban uh, uh, Russia for uh, from um, accessing any of their um, gas infrastructure, be it LNG or pi pipelines. Um, so, but so far the uh, problem is uh, quite um, acute and. Uh, uh while coal and uh, coal and oil and all pro products they are covered by sanctions gas uh, uh is not and uh, um uh, the biggest um growth in sales of russian fossil fuels uh was observed uh in the lng the liquefied natural gas and uh, this is um the uh fuel type that europe actually increased uh, buying in recent years and uh, in, just in November uh, the LNG uh, sales to Europe they reached, uh, reached uh, their record levels and uh, 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 in this year uh, so far the um, uh, exports uh, uh, of Russian LNG to uh, Europe uh, uh, totaled 8.3 billion uh, euro and uh, most of it is uh, going to uh, three countries, uh, Belgium, Spain, and France, uh, who collectively uh, purchase 88% uh, uh, of uh, from, from it. Uh, and uh, as you see, uh, Belgium uh, have uh, purchased 2.9 uh, billion worth of Russian LNG, uh, Spain the second with uh, 2.6 and the France is uh, third with 1.8 billion euro. Um, so uh, this is um, uh, quite uh, yeah um, outrageous I would say for for uh, from the Ukrainian um, uh, standpoint as uh, this is actually um, uh, could could be avoided uh, uh, if uh, the European uh, countries they they would um, invest uh, more effort into uh, uh, decreasing uh, the gas demand and uh, finding alternative suppliers of LNG and LNG is not an exclusive um, yeah uh, supply uh, chain and it is not the pipelines. Uh, LNG could be uh, bought from many countries of the world and uh, uh, there are uh, strong competitive uh, uh, pressure in the LNG market and uh, this clearly shows that Russia still has a strong leverage and uh, especially Novatech, uh, main uh, producer of LNG in Russia, has uh, still um, uh, political leverages to maintain its interests uh, in Europe. Um, so uh, Russia is uh, further uh, uh, expanding its uh, LNG capacity. They uh, invest in building new um, LNG export terminals and they plan to triple uh, their export capacity by 2030 uh, um, to um, 100 uh, million tons per year or uh, more. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, uh, succeeded in uh, building a first train of um, Arctic LNG2 project, uh, which I'll cover a bit later in, in this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, but um, uh, so far, um, the uh, exports of Russian LNG is mostly coming uh, from the single uh, facility, uh, Yamal LNG, uh, which is um, uh, the, like the flagship project of Novatech, which was built um, uh, in recent um, years, uh, but already after the... Uh, annexation of Crimea and uh, the start of uh, the Russia's uh, uh, invasion in Donbass in, in 2014, 
so uh, Yamal LNG was commissioned in 2017 and it was built uh, with European technology and uh, with uh, finance uh, from uh, um, European and international banks and uh, was enabled by uh, major uh, European partners uh, such as uh, French company Total Energies, uh, uh, who was uh, uh, the biggest um, uh, yeah, um, uh, profiteer from, from uh, this um, arrangement uh, of uh, Russian LNG exports uh, to Europe and uh, global markets. Um, and uh, they hold the uh, 10% stake in Yamal LNG, and they uh, basically enable uh, Russian uh, LNG uh, expansion globally. Uh, so Yamal LNG has the capacity of uh, around uh, 20 million uh, tons per year, and uh, to reach uh, their goal of uh, 100 uh, million tons per year, Russia would need to build a four new uh, terminal of the same uh, scale. Uh, but so far, uh, they are uh, building only one, uh, Arctic LNG2, and uh, they've, uh, as I mentioned, they uh, 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 completed the first train uh, of this uh, project, um, a first liquefaction train, uh, basically a um, structure uh, that um, uh, holds the the all of the equipment uh, so it's is a single facility that um, uh, is uh, uh, producing um, uh, LNG to be loaded on uh, LNG tankers uh, so um, why uh, why uh, gas is uh, still Im yeah important because gas uh, is uh, second after oil oil actually oil re oil revenues they are um, the main source of uh, 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 income for Kremlin but uh, gas is also significant uh, and uh, uh, Russia uh, is aiming to strategically expand its um, uh, LNG exports um so yeah, uh, here you see um, the uh, logistical uh, uh, arrangement of uh, uh, Russian LNG experts as they um, aim to um, start um, exports from uh, Arctic LNG to facility, which you can see uh, is just um, uh, on the other side of the. Gulf of Ob uh, River uh, in uh, in the uh, Gedan Peninsula, and uh, uh, the uh, supply of uh, Russian LNG uh, is um, consisting of two uh, legs. Uh, one uh, is uh, to be provided by Arctic LNG tankers. Uh, the icebreaker uh, class uh, vessels uh, which are needed to navigate in uh, uh, the Arctic Sea uh, and uh, for uh, further uh, uh, deliveries they uh, need um, uh, tankers from other countries uh, conventional LNG tankers uh, uh, which uh, were supposed to be receiving uh, Russian LNG in the transshipment uh, hubs, uh, uh, and uh, those transshipments hubs are basically a floating um, storage uh, units, uh, uh, huge vessels, which provide um, uh, storage um, of uh, LNG and uh, basically serve as intermediary points uh, for, uh, uh, for um, transportation of uh, Russian LNG. Uh, and uh, those two um, uh, floating storage units, they were sanctioned by the United States uh, uh, on the 2nd of November. And uh, uh, basically, uh, this means that uh, the movements transshipment hub, at least it will not uh, 
be uh, um, able to uh, supply uh, LNG to Europe because uh, European ships and uh, European customers would not be able uh, to buy um, the uh, LNG from from that unit, which is uh, blocked um, by uh, U.S. sanctions. Uh, so without violation, without uh, uh, direct violation of sanctions, uh, uh, this um, this supply road uh, is not available. Uh, but Russia could still export uh, LNG to Asia uh and um, yeah china and uh, india uh, through the northern sea road and um uh, they have another uh, transshipment hub uh, near kamchatka another loading storage unit um, and uh, uh, a lot uh, depends on how the g7 uh, will uh, shape its policy uh, towards uh, russian uh, expansion uh, in the LNG market, which is uh, um, will uh, is uh, clearly detrimental for for international uh, security and uh, uh, detrimental also for the LNG market because Russia will uh, try to manipulate it and uh, try to increase um, uh, uh, its uh, presence and manipulate the market to maximize profits. Um, yeah uh, why this uh yeah and the, just a conclusion to the uh, whole discussion why uh, it's uh, so important uh, that uh, sanctions um uh, against russian fossil fuels um should be uh, strengthened and uh, uh, enforced uh, uh, immediately um uh, uh, is that uh, Russia is aiming to uh, allocate a third of its uh, uh, total budget for 2024 into the uh, military and military industrial complex to uh, escalate its uh, war in Ukraine. And uh, uh, it, it compared to uh, pre-invasion uh, 2021, uh, that would mean tripling of uh, war expenditures and uh, military expenditures, and uh, that would be a highest uh, allocation of, of finance into military since the Soviet era. So um, the the urgency of uh, sanctions enforcement and the um, sanctions on Russian LNG is uh, uh, is uh, yeah is is very high and it's it's immediate so uh, uh we hope that um the united states and the european union will um act uh, swiftly and not limit to uh some uh half measures that we've seen uh, so far um thanks so much um and uh um, yeah, and um, j just a last point uh, 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 to get more insights uh, on these issues, you can um, download the reports um, on our website. Uh, we've uh, uh, produced uh, two uh, new reports uh, recently and uh, published them uh, during the uh, COP28. Um, uh, so, yeah, the first one. Uh, uh, covers the uh, uh, data on the uh, exports of Russian fossil fuels and uh, the effect of sanctions uh, on uh, those uh, uh, revenue streams from uh, for Russia. And the second report, it gives a more um, international perspective uh, on the dynamics uh, of uh, um, uh, corruption and state capture, which is associated with uh, deregulation of the fossil fuel industry. Um, yeah, uh, you can uh, download both reports at uh, our website, and uh, um, we are happy to um, share any information on request uh, with journalists and uh, researchers and uh, other um, interested parties. Uh, thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.
Yes, thank you so much, Oleg. Um, uh, Oleg Savitsky, Senior Campaign Manager for Razum We Stand, just spoke. And uh, given that we have lots of comments, uh, which means we provoke a lot of reflection around the sanctions, the effectiveness, and also the key Russian uh, fossil fuel uh, war enabler, enabler, the fossil fuels itself. Uh, so I would like to ask Oleg a follow-up question, the, uh, what we had about um, Ukraine, is Ukraine on selling uh, Russia gas to the EU? And maybe you could start after answering this question briefly. Uh, you you could start um, sharing your opinion on 12 sanction package, which we worked a lot on uh, to put important political demands into the stakeholders' ears in the EU just recently in October, November, and also uh, the U.S. newly adopted sanctions that targets specific companies and some certain share of the oil market as well. And whereas the, the most uh, obvious loopholes and how countries are still able to circumvent sanctions and um, where we have to act with the uh, all governments aligned. And the last will be uh, the next steps. We understand that yes, the whole world will be will be celebrating the holiday festive season soon, but um, in Ukraine there is no celebration because uh, we see that people uh, are being killed every day and uh, massive uh, massive war crimes just mount and mount, mount over the EU indefinite and uh, weak political willpower and also a global J7. J7 weakness to impose the full uh, package of sanctions once and forever and break down Russian economy for many generations ahead. So Oleg, to you, uh, the first please answer this uh, short question on uh, gas and then start kick off the discussion on the effectiveness of recently adopted sanctions. And then I will pass to Isaac and Redha to continue. Yeah, uh, so... Um... On the pipeline gas, as I mentioned, um, the transit contract um, uh, ends uh, uh, next year. Uh, and uh, the uh, big question is uh, for uh, Hungary and uh, Austria and uh, Slovakia um, is how to uh, replace uh, Russian fossil gas. And so far they uh, did uh, very little uh, to reduce their reliance on um, uh, supplies of uh, Russian gas, and they are lagging behind on energy efficiency measures, on reducing gas demand, uh, and uh, there uh, clearly a, a need uh, for the European Commission to um, make sure that the gas package uh, uh, will be implemented in those countries um, and uh, that they uh, will uh, shift their policies towards um, accelerated um, uh, deployment of renewables and energy efficiency improvements uh, to um, uh, break uh, this uh, addiction to Russian gas. Um, and uh, in relation to the 12 sanctions package, I think um, Isaac and uh, have they uh, can elaborate um, uh, more uh, on the oil uh, in oil price cap enforcement measures that are uh, provided there uh, uh, well uh, from uh, my uh, uh, impressions uh, it's uh, still weak and uh, it's uh, not sufficient to uh, uh, to uh, significantly reduce uh, Russian uh, profits from oil exports. Uh, and there are uh, clearly a lot of uh, space uh, for uh, political action. And uh, as uh, Isaac um, uh, showed, they, they were like uh, screaming uh, violations and screaming uh, uh, like loopholes, uh, like the case of uh, Bulgaria, uh, which uh, must be closed. And uh, uh, the uh, 12 sanctions package uh, is just a very slow incremental um, uh, progress uh, on sanctions, uh, while we need um, uh, really um, uh, um, 
transformative changes in the markets and uh, actually in the global energy system, which should exclude uh, Russian uh, fossil fuels altogether. And uh, um, we've uh, heard some like, uh, yeah, very, very initial um, statements from the US that uh, they aim to prevent Russian um, expansion in the LNG sector. Uh, but that is, um, yeah, that is uh, still uh, insufficient. And uh, the uh, fossil fuel experts from Russia, it's a, a global threat to international um, um, rule of law. And uh, it's basically the stream of corruption uh, that proliferates uh, globally. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I will probably pass to Isaac to reflect more on the enforcement. Thanks very much, Olen and Svetlana. Um, in terms of summarizing what I think um, about the sanctions, obviously, like we said in our analysis, we think they have had a positive effect of 14% reduction in oil export revenues. However, 14% is relatively minimal and not what could have been achieved. It's definitely not enough. Um, for my brief summary of what I've seen in relation to the oil sanctions package, in, including in the uh, uh, new measures announced this week, um, they seem rather minimal. For example, we think there needs to be a huge change in the, in the way the policy is monitored and enforced. Um, like we've touched on, kind of checking the bank statements uh, show that uh, prices were paid below the cap. Instead, what the trial sanctions package includes, from my understanding, is um, the requirement to itemize the different um, costs. So within those oil shipments to show how much was insurance, how much was um, freight and how much was for the actual uh, value of the oil. Um, so that's all fine, requiring um, traders and, and uh, entities involved with shipping oil to provide this breakdown in the prices. But if nobody's checking that, and if it's so easy to forge the price of insurance, the price of freight, the price of oil, it seems to me um, relatively pointless and, and likely to have minimal impact in terms of in increasing compliance. I hope I'm wrong, because obviously that will mean there's some um, greater compliance. But I think that is uh, my concern. Um, in terms of other measures regarding oil sanctions and the oil price cap, um, they mention a notification of the sale of tankers um, from European owners to um, those um, yeah, registered outside of, of Europe. Um, again, if it's just notifying them of who the seller is, um, they may have zero leverage to do anything with that information. So, yes, it could provide more transparency of who are the individuals that are buying these tankers. But when they're registered in the UAE, Hong Kong, um, uh, Singapore, where the jurisdictions of the enforcers are limited um, or, or kind of um, minimal in what they can actually do. Uh, again, the impact is likely to be um, minimal. Um, and finally, when tankers are sold to entities owned in, or registered in Russia, um, authorities have the option to approve or reject this. Um, again, it's a good start, but it's only as good as... Um, if they actually do reject these sales, I mean, surely that they have to be rejected is my uh, take. And the fact that they, it gives them the right to reject the sale of tankers to Russian owners uh, means that I worry about it, it being um, uh, followed through. Um, and also, it's quite easy to circumvent that by just registering entities in, in Russia's allies or countries that are uh, enabling Russia to increase its export revenues. So sorry to be doom and gloom, um, but I think that there needs to be... Um, more on that front and i guess the last thing that comes to mind is there is positive to take is maybe the lpg um sanctions uh which the eu is quoting would reduce russia's export revenues by up to a billion euros so i think that's a step in the right direction um lpg um being banned but um you know lng the much uh larger um, fossil fuel in terms of revenue and volumes is still um not being sanctioned so Without keeping you all, all day or getting too frustrated, I'll probably pause there. Is, is there something, um, Vape, have you want to add in on, on your reflection? Um, yeah, I can carry on with the doom and gloom, but I'd prefer not to repeat what everyone's already said, which is rather than also just introducing tighter sanctions, it's also necessary to look at the loopholes that already exist, just legal loopholes 
And in some cases, it almost seems like oversight, just the simple case of Bulgaria, which you had already presented, wherein they're actually importing Russian crude above the price cap because the, the sanctions don't cover any shipments going into Bulgaria. They don't have to be conducted under the price cap. It just seems like a bit of an oversight. Uh, another simple loophole is obviously the refined oil loophole, which uh, countries outside the price cap coalition are exploiting to import a lot of Russian oil and send back. Uh, so yeah, these are just two things that I would say should further be tightened. Okay, thank you so much, Vaidha, uh, 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 Isaac, Oleg, and Anna, who, yes, who just recently left, but uh, she delivered a presentation which was very clear and brilliant as well. So, and uh, just one sentence from every one of you summarizing the next steps that has to be taken to weaken Russian ability to wage the war against Ukraine and inside hostilities in other countries of the world, as we currently see on Israel Hamas war and in the MENA region. So, uh, to you, Oleg, well, let's start from you, just one sentence uh, that addresses the next steps. Yeah. Uh... Definitely, uh, the EU member states uh, should not wait uh, for uh, new sanctions packages. They must act on their um, uh, sovereign mandates and uh, countries like Belgium, uh, Spain, and, and France, they should uh, act immediately to prevent uh, further expansion of Russian LNG exports and stop facilitating it. Um, at least they must ban uh, transshipment. Uh, of Russian LNG, and uh, they uh, must also follow the uh, goals set at the EU level to phase out all Russian fossil fuels by 2027 in the framework of a Repower EU um, uh, plan. Uh, so uh, there's clearly a lot of um, uh, space for uh, real leadership on national level and uh, leadership uh, that's um, uh, takes a uh, personal responsibility and uh, courage uh, to confront Russian fossil fuel interests. Yeah, I guess one further summary is, is we've talked a lot and trying to not be too repetitive, obviously, tying up the loopholes, um, improving the um, impact of sanctions on Russia. I guess I'll try and end with a slightly positive um, note that uh, one example um, that could be quite effective is um, the US enforcement agencies, OFAC, have started to sanction um, some entities that look like they violated uh, measures. And this is um, perhaps, I mean, we've seen oil prices slightly go down since then. I'm not sure we can attribute that purely to that. But um, this sort of enforcement, um, which is a real, it's they've left it late in terms of the oil price cut coming into play. And, until October, we didn't see um, uh, sanctions being implemented on on entities violating measures. But keep keeping up that um, identification of uh, violating um, entities could have a positive impact uh, shown by OFAC. So basically, it's a big call for UK and EU to follow suit and and the US to keep um, upping their enforcement of the policy. Yeah, I think, again, to avoid repeating and maybe just to take a slightly larger macro level look, it's perhaps also important for countries to start and really seriously transitioning to green energy, start thinking about it uh, with a lot more seriousness. It will reduce Russia's leverage as well as provide them with a certain amount of political economic independence from this, from the chains of fossil fuels, essentially. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. And, and actually, to summarize with my own one sentence, I would say that the clean energy revolution will end the era of energy superpowers, which are largely based on fossil fuel dictatorships and autocratic regimes. And we are much, very much looking forward to fostering this, this time when we will, can liberate ourselves and our nations as well from the fossil fuel addiction that feeds wars and conflicts across the globe, and but in Ukraine specifically, where we are speaking from, uh, with you right now with Oleg. 
Uh, okay, thank you so much, our brilliant experts and speakers uh, from Korea, from Razon Wistan, and from Friedhof uh, Institute and Climate Strategies. And uh, see you next time. Follow us in social and our partners in social media. I will just remind whom you have to follow Razon Wistan, Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, Korea, and also Friedhof Nansen Institute and Climate Strategies. Follow us and follow the Stand with Ukraine campaign that we are established at the very first days of the war. And uh, we'll see you next time. If you have any comments, questions, or follow ups, please do send them to contact, uh, contact razonwistand.org. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks.